Hello and welcome to this webinar regarding cardiovascular risk assessment. My name is David Quigg and I am the Vice President of Scientific Support for Doctors Data. Now for the 18 years prior to coming to Doctors Data, I was entrenched in hands-on research pertaining to lipid biochemistry and atherosclerosis during my graduate and postgraduate work and also as a senior cardiovascular pharmacologist with a major pharmaceutical company. So I have a very strong interest in this subject. Now, as we all know, cardiovascular disease is indeed a multifactorial inflammatory disease process, and many of the established uh, risk factors can be mitigated or even eliminated by lifestyle choices. Due to the numerous factors involved, however, it isn't practical or cost-effective to have a single, all-inclusive, one-size-fits-all test panel to address all of the risk factors that contribute to the disease process. So many labs offer cardiovascular assessment panels, risk assessment panels, centered around lipid and lipoprotein levels and maybe homocysteine. And that's a good thing, as long as the most clinically sensitive and specific biomarkers are evaluated. But even then, we won't likely get the whole picture for many patients. For example, it is very clear from a plethora of research that excessive exposure to metals, various metals, can significantly ac accelerate the disease process. Just consider the results of the recent NIH-funded TAC trial of disodium EDTA. Further, it is now evident that aberrant methionine metabolism beyond elevated serum homocysteine can play a significant role in cardiovascular disease. So today I'm going to take a broad tack and specifically address not only our serum cardiovascular risk profile, but also discuss the role of excessive exposure to pro-oxidative glutathione depleting metals, not just xenobiotic metals such as a mercury or lead, but also some essential transition metals. And finally, pull together recent research regarding disruption of methionine metabolism and a more specific associated emerging risk factor for cardio cardiovascular disease. So we're going to think outside the box a bit today and cover some in-depth biochemistry. But not to worry, I will present the information in a very clinically applied case study format using test results from a real patient. Now, heart disease is still the number one cause of death uh, in the U.S., accounting for almost 25% of all deaths per year, basically equivalent between males and females, particularly after menopause in females. And there's about 1.5 million total acute myocardial infarctions per year. That is fatal and non-fatal. Coronary artery disease and stroke account for greater than $3 billion in health care costs and lost productivity, lost productivity each year. Now, our patient is a 71-year-old female. She's a former heavy smoker and a family history of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So she starts out behind the eight ball. She presented with fatigue, hypertension, excessive abdominal fat, and hyperglycemia. She was taking a statin, so a classic case of metabolic syndrome, and as we will see, cardiometabolic syndrome. She was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and insulin therapy was started shortly before the following assessment of her cardiovascular risk factors. So we start out with a standard lipids and lipoproteins. And as you can see here, her total cholesterol was very elevated. Her HDL cholesterol was dismally low. Uh, 
Her LDL cholesterol was markedly elevated, and importantly, she had hypertriglyceridemia. This is, of course, a fasted specimen. So this, is, this presents the common mixed dyslipidemia associated with metabolic syndrome. But one thing I'm going to be pointing out very heavily is the regulation of LDL and HDL metabolism uh, initiated by an expanded triglyceride pool. So let's move on with greater focus to the real LDL culprits, the oxidized LDL, small dense LDL, and LP little a. Oxidized LDL was significantly elevated in our patient, and oxidized LDL is a strong independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It initiates the, uh, it causes initiation and progression of atherogenesis, and it's associated with acute myocardial infarction, angina, metabolic syndrome, and overt hypothyroidism. Oxidized LDL elevated levels are associated with lifestyle factors such as smoking, exposure to environmental toxicants, oxidative stress, and trans fatty acids. It's also associated with insufficient antioxidant status, that is endogenous antioxidants such as glutathione and dietary antioxidants and or supplemental antioxidants. So to really appreciate the atherogenic role of this oxidized LDL, let's just take a look at normal LDL metabolism. LDL is a cholesterol ester-rich particle and contains only one APO lipoprotein, and that's ApoB100. That ApoB100 is the ligand for the LDL or ApoB receptors, which are very abundant on the liver. And that dictates highly regulated uptake of the LDL particles. However, when we have oxidized LDL, that is oxidized ApoB due to um, lipid peroxidation, the oxidized LDL, moderately oxidized LDL, is taken up by the CD36 scavenger receptors on macrophages, that is monocyte-derived macrophages, as opposed to the normal LDL receptor. So the macrophages take up in an unregulated manner the oxidized LDL. They're just doing their job. They take out the trash, basically. Unfortunately, when they get full of these oxidized LDL, they start to balloon up and become foam cells. Now, let's take a look at the real culprit, the oxidized LDL, and compare it to uh, LDL. And what we're looking at here is the percentage of cardiovascular disease patients um, compared to different quintiles of LDL. And as we can see, there is very little relationship, uh, basically a flat line between the um, very low levels of LDL and very high levels of LDL with respect to cardiovascular disease. In sharp contrast, if we take the same plot and, and, and put in oxidized LDL, we see that as we go across the low to the highest quintile, there is a very significant slope and linear relationship between the level of oxidized LDL and the risk or occurrence of cardiovascular disease. Now, there's even greater risk of cardiovascular disease when we combine oxidized LDL with metabolic syndrome. And this is from a study of about 880 adults, the MESA study. So on the, uh, the y-axis, we have the odds ratio for cardiovascular disease plotted against oxidized high and low oxidized LDL in the absence or presence of metabolic syndrome. And you can see, as we just showed with the slope, that there is higher risk with high levels of oxidized LDL versus low, and that's without metabolic syndrome. However, look what happens. We have a synergistic effect when we have either low or high levels of oxidized LDL plus metabolic syndrome. So there is a nasty synergistic effect with oxidized LDL and metabolic syndrome. 
and this is these data were adjusted for relevant covariates. So oxidized LDL is associated with increased risk of um, cardiovascular disease, and that's exacerbated when metabolic syndrome is present. However, oxidized LDL also appears to be associated with metabolic syndrome. And if we look at the bottom panel, again, comparing LDL to the culprit oxidized LDL and looking at relative risk um, for cardiovascular disease, we can see that for LDL, there's basically no relationship as we go across the quintiles of increasing levels of LDL cholesterol. Again, very differently, if we look at the same type of plot risk against quintiles of oxidized LDL, we again see a more linear relationship with higher uh, risk for metabolic syndrome with higher levels of oxidized LDL. And this data was derived from the CARDIA study, which was a five-year follow-up study of over 200 adults. Now, there's a common mechanism for the increased risk for cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome associated with oxidized LDL, and that entails the adipokine adiponectin, which is a very abundant anti-inflammatory uh, hormone secreted by fat cells that stimulates insulin re release, improves insulin sensitivity, and stimulates fatty acid oxidation. Now, adiponectin also suppresses excess production of reactive oxygen species in vascular endothelial cells. And low levels of cir circulating uh, adiponectin are associated with metabolic syndrome, inflammation, obesity, and higher levels of oxidized LDL. So low adiponectin, high oxidized LDL. So adiponectin is a modulator of oxidized LDL and is associated with increased risk for metabolic syndrome as well as cardiovascular disease. Now let's switch gears just for a moment since we're talking about oxidized products and look at the relationship between metals, oxidative stress, glutathione, and cardiovascular disease. On the left, we see the most commonly encountered xenobiotic metals, cadmium, arsenic, lead, and mercury. And we know from the literature that in order for the body to get rid of, say, uh, inorganic divalent mercury, it requires two glutathiones to be conjugated to it. And that's great because we get rid of the mercury, but we're short two glutathiones. Now we move to the right side of the upper panel, we can see the transition elements, including the essential elements, iron and copper, which are known to induce excess formation of reactive oxygen species, such as the superoxide anion and the uh, very radical hydroxy, ra um, hydroxy radical. When we have a decrease in glutathione associated with getting rid of toxicants and increased production of reactive oxygen species, that can really drain our glutathione stores, result in decreased glutathione that's associated with endothelial cell dysfunction, vascular inflammation, oxidized lipids, oxidized proteins, as I said, oxidized ApoB on LDL, and importantly, oxidized oxidative damage to DNA as measured by 8-hydroxy-D-guanosine in the urine. Now, I want to I want to pick on one of the uh, most common uh, xenobiotic metals out there, for which we have the greatest information with respect to its role in cardiovascular disease. And lead causes a very very nasty cascade. Because with lead exposure and excessive retention, we see increased production of both radical and non-radical reactive oxygen species. On the left, we see that that activates uh, NF-kappa B, which in turn further produces more reactive oxygen species. 
But when we look to the right, we see that that also is associated with decreased nitric oxide, no. And that's partially because when we have the superoxide ion reacting with nitric oxide, we convert no to O no. And O no is peroxynitrite. And peroxynitrite further perpetuates this nasty cycle because it in and of itself further activates uh, NF-kappa B and increases uh, reactive oxygen species. Now, when we increase NF-kappa B, as you know, that results in increased expression and release of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, and adhesion molecules. The net effect is that we get increased oxidation of LDL, monocyte adhesion, uh, to the endothelial cells, foam cell formation, that is the macrophages getting loaded up, uh, endothelial injury, and not only platelet activation, but decreased tissue plasma uh, platelet activation inhibitor. And with decreased nitric oxide, which is a vasodilatory uh, agent, uh, and peroxynitrite, we get vasoconstriction, sodium retention, and increased adrenergic activity. All this ultimately culminates in hypertension, atherosclerosis, and thrombosis, which of course can result in the clot and the myocardial infarction. Now, I talked about um, oxidative damage to DNA, and that's expressed in the urine, or we see it in the urine, in the form of 8-hydroxy-2-deoxy-D-guanosine, 8-hydroxy-DG, which turns out to be a predictor of cardiac events. And that's formed because from the hydroxy radical. And that, the hydroxy radical is formed by two primary uh, reactions. One, the Fenton reaction, where ferrous iron takes an electron from non-radical hydrogen peroxide and produces the hydroxide ion, which is fine, but also the hydroxy radical. In a second reaction, known as the Haber-Weiss reaction, the superoxide anion, reacts with the hydrogen peroxide again to form the hydroxy radical or hydroxy radical. And that hydroxy radical is electron starved. It is extremely reactive. It's an equal opportunity offender. It attacks the nearest macromolecule. Being electron starved, it causes oxidative stress and damages the molecules. In fact, we can't even measure the hydroxy radical because it only has a half-life of about a millionth of a second. Now, very vulnerable to attack by the hydroxy radical is the nucleoside base 2-deoxyguanosine found in DNA. So the hydroxy radical attacks and oxidizes the guanosine residue of the 2-deoxyguanosine, and as a result, we get production of 8-hydroxy-DG, which is excreted in the urine. It's excreted in the urine because we have endonuclease enzymes that cleave the oxidized uh, guanosine, and that's why we end up seeing it in the urine. Now, 8-hydroxy-DG is a very sensitive biomarker of intracellular oxidative stress, and in this case produced in damaged cardiac tissue, that is, the mitochondrial DNA. An elevated urinary 8-hydroxy-DG has been highly correlated with clinical status and cardiac dysfunction. In fact, if we look at a prospective study of 186 uh, chronic heart failure patients with a 1.8 year follow-up, we can see that for the patients that had elevated 8-hydroxy-DG levels, and in this study they used uh, urine 8-hydroxy-DG levels greater than 12.4 nanograms per gram, there was a significant four-fold increase, or four times increase, I should say, in the hazard ratio that is for cardiac events.
So 8-hydroxy-DG appears to be a great predictor uh, or a good predictor of cardiac events. So let's talk some more about this uh, relationship between glutathione, oxidative stress, and cardiovascular disease. We know that low levels of, or we know that um, when we have um, uh, reduced glutathione levels, that is, versus oxidized, um, reduced levels of glutathione are inversely correlated with arterial intimal medial thickness, that is, reduced glutathione versus oxidized glutathione. So reduced glutathione is very protective against cardiovascular disease. And we see oxidative stress, which results in um, um, uh, modified or moderately oxidized LDL, which results in unregulated uptake of that modified or the moderately oxidized LDL by the macrophages. That results in oxidative damage to the macrophages themselves and they can in turn oxidize normal and small dense LDL. Now I worked with a lot of different models, uh, animal models, cell models, and humans, and I can tell you one thing that rats do not get atherosclerosis spontaneously, nor no matter how much coconut oil and cholesterol you feed them. However, if you use the genetically modified ApoE null rats, they will get spontaneous atherosclerosis. And in a model of ApoE null rats, oral liposomal glutathione decreased oxidized LDL uptake, oxidized macrophages with their increased cholesterol ester content, and most importantly, the, uh, decreased the aortic lesion area by 30% versus control liposomes that, can, that didn't contain glutathione. Now, we know from um, past literature that both HDL and, and LDL particles circulate uh, in association with the fat-soluble antioxidants, the tocopherols, or vitamin E. But a colleague of mine was working with a, an expert in glutathione peroxidase and they found that HDL also circulated not only in association with the enzyme glutathione peroxidase, which uh, neutralizes lipid peroxides, but also with its substrate glutathione. So both HDL and LDL are protected by glutathione peroxidase and glutathione in circulation. Furthermore, HDL has been recently been found to circulate in association with paraoxinase 1, better known as PON1. And PON1 is most commonly uh, recognized for its ability to hydrolyze organophosphorus compounds such as the, um, uh, the uh, herbicides and uh, insecticides. Now, PON1 also hydrolyzes lipid peroxides and thereby decreases oxidation of lipids, which can oxidize the ApoB in LDL. So these lipoproteins do circulate, and the, that is, the, the nice full-sized particles circulate in association with some antioxidant protection. Now, let's move on to the second LDL culprit subspecies, the small, dense LDL. Again, our patient had significantly elevated levels of the atherogenic small, dense LDL, which is a strong, independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Small, dense LDL is a cholesterol ester depleted uh, particle as smaller, so it re readily penetrates the endothelium. It carries less antioxidants, glutathione and the tocopherols, and therefore is more readily oxidized, but also more readily glycosylated, particularly in the cases of dysglycemia. These, ox these, uh, these small dense LDL are taken up by the macrophage scavenger receptors, just like are the oxidized LDL. 
Small dense LDL are associated with elevated triglyceride levels and low HDL uh, cholesterol ester. Um, and we will talk extensively about that mechanism and the role of triglycerides in uh, regulating the uh, lipoprotein particle size. Now, intervention for small uh, elevated levels of small dense LDL include niacin, fish oil, and the pharmaceutical fibrates. Now, it should be noted that some studies have reported an increase in small dense LDL when uh, statins are given uh, to people that do not have elevated triglyceride levels. So just something to consider. So let's take a look at the mechanisms by which triglyceride levels influence the uh, lipoprotein uh, metabolism. As we know, um, VLDL are released from the liver as a triglyceride-rich particle, and then via the action of lipoprotein lipase, its triglyceride core is depleted and releases free fatty acids, which are taken up by tissues, and then we get the resultant cholesterol ester-rich LDL particle. Um, likewise, um, the, with a normal triglyceride level, there is a relatively small donor pool of triglyceride such that the activity of the neutral lipid transfer protein uh, basically causes a very manageable transfer of triglyceride uh, into the cholesterol ester-rich HDL2 particles, but it's, it's very manageable because lipoprotein lipase and hepatic lipase can hydrolyze that HDL triglyceride acquired from the normal VLDL triglyceride pool and then through further action of lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase those HDL particles can pick up free cholesterol from the periphery, esterify it to a fatty acid, and tuck it away in its core. So that's what we see with normal triglyceride levels. But let's see what happens when we have an expanded VLDL triglyceride pool, that is a donor pool. Through the activity of the lipid transfer protein, the expanded triglyceride pool results in a net transfer of triglyceride from VLDL to both HDL and to LDL. When that happens, the LDL now that is enriched with triglycerides, the triglycerides get cleaved and hydrolyzed by hepatic lipase and lipoprotein lipase, and then we end up with a smaller, dense LDL particle that contains primarily cholesterol esters. Likewise, when we have the expanded triglyceride pool in HDL, again, through the activity of the triglyceride hydrolytic activity of hepatic lipase and lipoprotein lipase, we lose that triglyceride core end up, and then end up with a much smaller, denser HDL3 particle which is more atherogenic than is the large buoyant uh, uh, HDL2 particle. So I, I hope you can appreciate and will you know, pay more attention to an expanded triglyceride pool because it really acts as a donor that affects the metabolism and size of both HDL and LDL towards a more atherogenic lipoprotein profile. Our final LDL culprit subspecies is a funny little particle called LP little a, which you can see is markedly elevated in our patient. It's primarily um, from an inherited disorder, and LP little a is an independent risk factor for premature heart disease, atherosclerosis, and thrombosis, as well as stroke. Now, LP little a, I said it's a funny little particle because it really consists of the LDL ApoB uh, bound by disulfide bonds to Apo little a. And this funny little particle is a structural antagonist for plasminogen, uh, 
and tissue plasminogen activator. So it binds to places where plasminogen would bind, but it doesn't have any fibrinolytic activity. Furthermore, LP little a also stimulates the secretion of tissue plasminogen activator inhibitor, further contributing to thrombogenesis clots and then possibly even um, uh, acute myocardial infarction. Now, the literature suggests that we may be able to slightly decrease LP little a with diet and exercise. And there are several studies that show beneficial effects of decreasing LP little a uh, in some individuals using fish oil, low-dose aspirin, or niacin. And in the studies of niacin, they typically found about a 20 to 30 percent decrease with about one to three grams per day, generally using the time-release niacin, so not necessarily the, the great flush form of niacin. Then we also look at the, lip, the ratios of lipoproteins and apolipoproteins. And as, uh, as in old school, we look at the ratio of the proatherogenic LDL to the anti-atherogenic HDL, which is uh, significantly out of whack in our patient. More, uh, more specifically and more importantly, her ratio of oxidized LDL to HDL was also significantly uh, out of whack on the high end. And interestingly, her small dense LDL compared to her total LDL was in the normal range. But that's simply a ratio, and the ratio is within the normal range because they were both so markedly elevated. So you have to be careful when you look at ratios. Now, speaking of ratios, we also look at the ratio of the ApoB, which is the, the only apolipoprotein on LDL particles, and apolipoprotein A1, which is the predominant apoprotein on HDL. So by looking at the ratio of ApoB to ApoA1, we're looking at a ratio of LDL to HDL particle number, which in this case is moderately elevated and that's due primarily to the higher level of apolipoprotein B, which is up in the very high range, and the ApoA1, the HDL-associated protein, is moderately suppressed. Now, on to non-lipid and lipoprotein uh, risk factors. Um, first, let's talk about C-reactive protein, which is, of course, a, a, an acute uh, uh, phase response uh, protein, uh, and coronary artery, coronary artery disease is, as I said before, uh, absolutely an inflammatory disease, and numerous guidelines um, suggest that um, elevated levels of high-sensitivity CRP is an independent biomarker of risk for uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Now CRP is CRP and HSCRP just simply means that a more sensitive assay, a high sensitivity assay was used to measure lower levels of CRP which are associated with cardiovascular disease. So CRP is a strong independent predictor of myocardial infarction and stroke for asymptomatic men and women. Elevated CRP has also been related to increase with increased risk for metabolic syndrome in a huge cohort of 15,000 apparently healthy women. And this was an eight-year follow-up study, so very, very impressive that CRP was associated uh, in the long run with development of metabolic syndrome. Now, we commonly see elevated uh, CRP with cardiovascular disease, uh, smoking, hypertension, that's our patient, uh, overfat, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, and don't shoot me, I'm just the messenger, uh, hormone replacement therapy. And some suggested interventions for elevated HS or CRP in the literature include low-dose aspirin, 
which I can deal with. Statins, uh, also lower C-reactive protein, also have antioxidant properties, and low-dose methotrexate. Not something I'd necessarily want to do. Now, as with oxidized LDL, uh, CRP uh, and, and metabolic syndrome, CRP enhances the risk prediction at all levels of LDL cholesterol. So we see over on the left, uh, going from low to high, the level of risk for cardiovascular disease. And across the x-axis, we go from very high to, very, uh, to low levels of LDL. And then going across the axis on the right, we go from low to moderate to elevated CRP. And you can see at all levels of cholesterol, even very high or very low, as we increase the level of CRP, we increase the risk for um, uh, cardiovascular disease. In fact, we see a similar level of risk with low levels of LDL cholesterol and high levels of CRP, nearly equivalent to that of high levels of LDL and moderate levels of CRP. And then at the very top here, the, the uh, big gray bar uh, represents the um, risk associated with our patient who had very high LDL cholesterol and elevated CRP. So here is the level of CRP in our patient, 4.5, which is in the very high, in the high range. And according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the American Heart Association, we like to see CRP below 1. It's, it's associated with moderate risk between 1 and 3. And unfortunately, 25% of adults in our U.S. population are at high risk with respect to CRP. And of course, when you get very high levels of CRP, it's frequently associated with infection, uh, say a broken bone, a torn ligament, something like that. And it's suggested that you, quote, ignore that value. That means ignore it with respect to interpreting risk for heart disease and repeat the test at a later date. Now, homocysteine has been um, known as a independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease, thanks to the diligent work of Dr. McCulley. And it's widely accepted as an independent risk factor for not only coronary, but also cere uh, cere cerebral vascular, as well as peripheral vascular disease. And now studies are beginning to report that elevated homocysteine has prog prognostic value for an individual if it's markedly elevated. Um, and again, that's for an individual. But there's a, a new development, and that is that elevated plasma homocysteine may simply be reflecting uh, something more significant and that is increased intracellular levels of its precursor, S-adenosyl homocysteine, which we'll refer to as SAH, S-A-H. And here's the homocysteine level in our patient, as, as if the other biomarkers weren't bad enough. She had a remarkable homocysteine level of 25.3. You don't typically see that. Now, the question has become, is homocysteine simply uh, associated with cardiovascular disease, or is it, in fact, causal? And certainly, cross-sectional studies have shown that homocysteine is associated with cardiovascular disease, thrombotic disease, Alzheimer's disease, cardiorenal syndrome, end-stage renal disease, and osteoporosis and back to our oxidative stress and lead. And anytime you hear the word osteoporosis, think about accelerated or ex extensive release of the, the huge bone lead stores into the soft tissues. And we see this a lot with uh, peri and menopausal women where we have decreased bone density and release of those vast bone lead stores. <clears throat> 
Now, in vitro, homocysteine increases monocyte and T-cell adhesion to human aortic endothelial cells, and several mechanisms have been proposed for the relationship in a causal manner uh, with cardiovascular disease, and they include production of reactive oxygen species, endothelial dysfunction and damage, uh, homocysteine being prothrombotic and inhibiting thrombolysis, uh, thrombolysis. Uh, it causes proliferation of vascular smooth muscle cells, and very interesting, decreases HDL uh, production via inhibition of hepatic APOA1 synthesis. It's also been shown to decrease uh, lecithin cholesterol acyl transfers act transfer activity. However, all of these kind of conclusions about these mechanisms have been derived from in vitro studies where they used extremely high concentrations of homocysteine. Now, a more realistic study um, indicates, or at least suggested back in 2001, that S adenosyl homocysteine may be a more clinically sensitive and specific risk factor as a, compared to homocysteine. And this was derived from a study of 30 coronary artery disease patients versus 29 controls, and they were um, a match for age and sex. And as you can see, there was a great overlap for homocysteine between the coronary artery disease patients and controls, 12.8 and 11, not statistically significant. However, despite being a thousand times lower in plasma, there was a very significant difference uh, with increased levels of SAL for the patients compared to the controls. So this was a, a very preliminary study back in 2001, and it really caught my attention. And I waited with bated breath for about 12 years, and finally, um, in 2013, uh, researchers from China uh, published a study in which they looked at uh, over 1,000 coronary angiography patients, ages 27 to 87, and they looked at plasma homocysteine and saw levels at baseline, and then after three years, then they applied the Cox proportional hazards model to evaluate risk for cardiovascular events, which included fatal cardiovascular disease or fatal MIs, non-fatal MIs, and stroke. The outcome, they had 93 participants that had such events, and uh, adjusting for age and sex, the hazard ratio for cardiovascular events was increased by 3.4 for each one standard deviation increase in plasma saw concentration, which was statistically significant and well within the confidence limits. There were no significant effects of age, sex, or other risk factors. So elevated levels of plasma saw appear to be independently associated with increased risk of coronary events. Unfortunately, very, very few laboratories have the equipment or the expertise to measure the very low levels of SAW, even though they seem to be a much better predictor and greater clinical sensitivity than homocysteine. So where does this SAW come from? We're all familiar with the methionine metabolism, where we go from methionine to methyl donor SAM which provides the methyl groups for all methyltransferase enzymes in the body. Then we go on down to SAL. And then from SAL, in a reversible reaction, um, there is a conversion of SAL to homocysteine. Homocysteine, of course, is the branch point where we can go off to the right down through transsulfuration, uh, through cystathionine to cysteine to glutathione or we can go off to the left and remethylate homocysteine to form methionine through a series of uh, uh, enzymatic reactions. So there's a problem when homocysteine or adenosine accumulate because it drives that reaction north that normally goes south and we get an accumulation of salt. 
And SOL is not only uh, a very, very potent inhibitor of all methyltransferase enzymes, but also, as we saw, it appears to be a seriously emerging risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So how, why do we get this accumulation in homocysteine? Well, we can have epigenetic factors, such as nutritional deficiencies, uh, insufficient folate, B12, B6, betaine or uh, a lack of the ability to convert folate to 5-methyl uh, tetrahydrofolate. Um, or we can have another epigenetic phenomenon bypassing the MTHFR step where everybody always gets hung up, and that is at methionine synthase, the next enzyme uh, downstream. And the reason for that is that environmental toxicants such as mercury, lead, copper, aluminum, acetaldehyde, and oxidative stress, there's our hydroxy radical, um, cause for to inactivate methionine synthase. So you can pump through MTHFR all you want, but as long as that cobalt moiety of the, the B12 constituent of the methionine synthase enzyme is oxidized, it can't accept the methyl group uh, from 5-MTHF and transfer it to homocysteine to remethylate to form methionine. Now, if that's not enough problems, of course, we have a multitude of single nucleotide polymorphisms that further um, cause disruption of normal methionine metabolism. So we have all these different factors, epigenetic and genetic factors, that can cause increased homocysteine and decreased methylation and elevated levels of SOL. So how does a clinician go about dealing with this situation when you have so many things going on? So to address this issue, we came up with a, uh, a, a methylation profile that looks at the phenotypic, phenotypic expression in the individual. That is, it reflects the combination of genetic and epigenetic factors on methionine metabolism for a given individual, in this case for our patient. And you can see that in our patient, uh, her methionine, and this is fasted, her methionine is low, suggesting that she's not remethylating well, perhaps MTHFR, uh, perhaps the oxidative stress affecting in an adverse way methionine synthase. She doesn't appear to be producing a lot of cysteine uh, or maybe is using it up too fast, so maybe not going down through transulfuration efficiently. But very importantly, on a separate occasion, Again, measuring homocysteine, it was again markedly elevated, which drives that reaction north and causes an accumulation and, a, and at least a two times elevation, greater than two times elevation in SOL. Importantly, looking at the SAM to SOL ratio, which is an indication of overall methylation capacity, her ratio was very low at two and that indicates very poor ability to methylate uh, many different uh, molecules uh, in the body. So my take home messages are pretty direct and simple. Cardiovascular risk assessment is not diagnostic. However, this particular patient who lit up on so many risk factors did in fact have a massive acute myocardial infarction, and quadruple bypass surgery. The levels of the real culprit LDL subspecies and the apolipoproteins provide much greater clinical sensitivity than the old HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, uh, total cholesterol picture. Very importantly, an expanded VLDL triglyceride pool has adverse effects on HDL and LDL metabolism and HDL and LDL speciation that is resulting in decreased size and uh, decreased density of both HDL and LDL 
which results in an increased risk, uh, a, a higher risk profile for lipoproteins related to cardiovascular disease. Oxidized LDL is not only pro-atherogenic, but it also appears to be associated with increased risk for metabolic syndrome. And do consider lead reactive and reactive uh, uh, redox active transition metals and their associated oxidative stress and suppression of glutathione status. Aberrant methionine metabolism is associated with increased risk for cardiovascular disease, and SAW is, an emerging, is emerging as an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So finally, cardiovascular risk assessment can facilitate targeted, individualized clinical and lifestyle interventions to mitigate risk for cardiovascular disease and importantly, can be used to monitor uh, the efficacy of your clinical intervention to reduce that risk and show patient compliance as well. So I thank you very kindly for your attention and your very good intentions and for additional information.